Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice J, and this is a show where we get you ready for a great night's sleep with some old familiar stories that you haven't heard in a while. Links to every story can be found in the show notes at our website, bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight's story, A Bank Fraud by Rudyard Kipling. If Reggie Burke were in India now, he would resent this tale being told. But as he's in Hong Kong and won't say it, the telling is safe. He was the man who worked the big fraud on the Sind and Solcock Bank. He was manager of an upcountry branch and a sound practical man with a large experience of native loan and insurance work. He could combine the frivolities of ordinary life with his work and yet do well. Reggie Burke rode anything that would let him get up, danced as neatly as he rode, and was wanted for every sort of amusement in this. As he said himself, and as many men found out rather to their surprise, there were two Burks, both very much at your service. Reggie Burke, between four and ten, ready for anything, from a hot weather gymkhana to a riding picnic, and between ten and four, Mr. Reginald Burke, manager of the Sindon Selcott Branch Bank. You might play polo with him one afternoon and hear him express his opinions when a man crossed. And you might call on him next morning to raise a 2,000 rupee loan on a 500 pound insurance policy. 80 pounds paid in premiums. He would recognize you, but you would have some trouble in recognizing him. The directors of the bank, it had its headquarters in Calcutta, and its general manager's word carried weight with the government. Picked their men well. They had tested Reggie up to a fairly severe breaking strain. They trusted him just as much as directors ever trust managers. You must see for yourself whether their trust was misplaced. Reggie's branch was in a big station and worked with the usual staff. One manager, one accountant, both English, a cashier and a horde of native clerks, besides the police patrol at nights outside. The bulk of its work, for it was in a thriving district, was hundi and accommodation of all kind. A fool has no grip of this sort of business, and a clever man who does not go about among his clients and know more than a little of their affairs is worse than a fool. Reggie was young-looking, clean-shaved, with a twinkle in his eye, and a head that nothing short of a gallon of the Gunner's Madeira could make any impression on. One day, at a big dinner, he announced casually that the directors had shifted on to him a natural curiosity from England in the accountant line. He was perfectly correct. Mr. Silas Riley, accountant, was the most curious animal. A long, gawky, raw-boned Yorkshireman, full of the savage self-conceit that blossoms only in the best county in England. Arrogance was a mild word for the mental attitude of Mr. S. Riley. He had worked himself up after seven years to a cashier's position in a Huddersfield bank, and all his experience lay among the factories of the north. Perhaps he would have done better on the Bombay side, where they are happy with one half percent. Profits and money is cheap. He was useless for Upper India and a wheat province, where a man wants a large head and a touch of imagination if he's to turn out a satisfactory balance sheet. He was wonderfully narrow-minded in business, and being new to the country, had no notion that Indian making is totally distinct from homework. Like most clever self-made men, he had much simplicity in his nature, and somehow or other had construed the ordinarily polite terms of his letter of engagement into a belief that the directors had chosen him on account of his special and brilliant talents, and that they set great store by him. This notion grew and crystallized, thus adding to his natural North Country conceit. Further, he was delicate, suffered from some trouble in his chest, and was short in his temper. You'll admit that Reggie had reason to call his new accountant a natural curiosity. The two men failed to hit it off at all. Riley considered Reggie a wild, feather-headed idiot, given to heaven only knew what dissipation in low places called messes, and totally unfit for the serious and solemn vocation of banking. He could never get over Reggie's look of youth and his air. 
and he couldn't understand Reggie's friends, clean-built, careless men in the army who rode over to big Sunday breakfasts at the bank and told sultry stories till Riley got up and left the room. Riley was always showing Reggie how the business ought to be conducted, and Reggie had more than once to remind him that seven years' limited experience between Huddersfield and Beverly did not qualify a man to steer a big upcountry business. Then Riley sulked and referred to himself as a pillar of the bank and a cherished friend of the director, and Reggie tore his hair. If a man's English subordinates fail him in this country, it comes to a hard time indeed, for native help has strict limitations. In the winter, Riley went sick for weeks at a time with his lung complaint, and this threw more work on Reggie, but he preferred it to the everlasting friction when Riley was well. One of the traveling inspectors of the bank discovered these collapses and reported them to the directors. Now, Riley had been foisted on the bank by an MP, who wanted the support of Riley's father, who, again, was anxious to get his son out to a warmer climate because of those lungs. The MP had a interest in the bank, and one of the directors wanted to advance a nominee of his own. But after Riley's father had died, he made the rest of the board see that an accountant who was sick for half the year had better give place to a healthy man. If Riley had known the real story of his appointment, he might have behaved better. But knowing nothing, his stretches of sickness alternated with restless, persistent, meddling irritation of Reggie and all the hundred ways in which conceit in a subordinate situation can find play. Reggie used to call him striking and hair-curling names behind his back as a relief to his own feelings. But he never abused him to his face, because he said, Riley is such a frail beast that half of his loathsome conceit is due to pains in his chest. Late one April, Riley went very sick indeed. The doctor punched him and thumped him and told him he would be better before long. Then the doctor went to Reggie and said, Do you know how sick your accountant is? No, said Reggie. The worse the better, confound him. He's a packing nuisance when he's well. I'll let you take away the bank safe if you can drug him silently for this hot weather. But the doctor did not. Man, I'm not joking, he said. I'll give him another three weeks in his bed and a week or so more to die in. On my honor and reputation, that's all the grace he has in his... Consumption has hold of him to the marrow. Reggie's face changed at once into the face of Mr. Reginald Burke, and he answered, What can I do? Nothing, said the doctor. For all practical purposes, the man is dead already. Keep him quiet and cheerful and tell him he's going to recover. That's all. I'll look after him to the end, of course. The doctor went away, and Reggie sat down to open the evening mail. His first letter was one from the director's, intimating for his information that Mr. Riley was to resign, under a month's notice, by the terms of his agreement, telling Reggie that their letter to Riley would follow and advising Reggie of the coming of a new accountant, a man whom Reggie knew and liked. Reggie lit a cheroot, and before he had finished smoking, he had sketched the outline of a fraud. He put away, burked, the director's letter, and went in to talk to Riley, who was as ungracious as usual and fretting himself over the way the bank would run during his illness. He never thought of the extra work on Reggie's shoulders, but solely of the damage to his own prospects of advancement. Then Reggie assured him that everything would be well, and that he, Reggie, would confer with Riley daily on the management of the bank. Riley was a little soothed, but he hinted in as many words that he did not think much of Reggie's business capacity. Reggie was humble and he had letters in his desk from the directors that a Gilbart or a Hardy might have been proud of. The days passed in the big darkened house, and the director's letter of dismissal to Riley came and was put away by Reggie, who every evening brought the books to Riley's room and showed him what had been going forward while Riley sn- Reggie did his best to make statements pleasing to Riley, but his accountant was sure that the bank was going to rack and ruin without him. In June, as the lying in bed told on his spirit, he asked whether his absence had been noted by the directors, and Reggie said they had written most sympathetic letters, hoping that he would be able to resume his valuable services before long. He showed Riley the letters, 
and Riley said that the directors ought to have written to him direct. A few days later, Reggie opened Riley's mail in the half-light of the room and gave him the sheet, not the envelope, of an envelope to Riley from the directors. Riley said he would thank Reggie not to interfere with his private papers, especially as Reggie knew he was too weak to open his own letters. Reggie apologized. Then Riley's mood changed, and he lectured Reggie on his evil ways, his horses, and his bad friends. Of course, lying here on my back, Mr. Burke, I can't keep you straight, but when I'm well, I do hope you'll pay some heed to my words. Reggie, who had dropped polo and dinners and tennis and all to attend to Riley, said that he was penitent and settled Riley's head on the pillow and heard him fret and contradict in hard, dry, hacking whispers without a sign of impatience. This at the end of a heavy day's office work, doing double duty in the latter half of June. When the new accountant came, Reggie told him the facts of the case and announced to Riley that he had a guest staying with him. Riley said that he might have had more consideration than to entertain his doubtful friends at such a time. Reggie made Karen, the new accountant, sleep at the club in consequence. Karen's arrival took some of the heavy work off his shoulders, and he had time to attend to Riley's exactions, to explain, soothe, invent, and settle and resettle the poor wretch in bed, and to forge complimentary letters from Calcutta. At the end of the first month, Riley wished to send some money home to his mother. Reggie sent the draft. At the end of the second month, Riley's salary came in just the same. Reggie paid it out of his own pocket and with it wrote Riley a beautiful letter from the doctors. Riley was very ill indeed, but the flame of his life burnt unsteadily. Now and then, he would be cheerful and confident about the future, sketching plans for going home and seeing his mother. Reggie listened patiently when the office work was over and encouraged him. At other times, Riley insisted on Reggie's reading the Bible and grim methody tracts to him. Out of these tracts, he pointed morals directed at manager. But he always found time to worry Reggie about the working of the bank and to show him where the weak This indoor, sick room life and constant strains wore Reggie down a good deal and shook his nerves and lowered his billiard play by 40 points. But the business of the bank and the business of the sick room had to go on, though the glass was 116 degrees in the shade. At the end of the third month, Riley was thinking fast and had begun to realize that he was very sick. But the conceit that made him wary Reggie kept him from believing the worst. He wants some sort of mental stimulant if he is to drag on, said the doctor. Keep him interested in life if you care about his living. So Riley, contrary to all the laws of business and the finance, received a 25% rise of salary from the directors. The mental stimulant succeeded beautifully. Riley was happy and cheerful and, as is often the case in consumption, healthiest in mind when the body was weakest. He lingered for a full month, snarling and fretting about the bank, talking of the future, hearing the Bible read, lecturing Reggie on sin, and wondering when he would be able to move abroad. At the end of September, one mercilessly hot evening, he rose up in his bed with a little gasp and said quickly to Reggie, Mr. Burke, I'm going to die. I know it in myself. My chest is all hollow inside and there's nothing to breathe with. To the best of my knowledge, I have done nought. He was returning to the talk of his boyhood to lie heavy on my conscience. God be thanked. I have been preserved from the grosser forms of sin, and I counsel you, Mr. Burke. Here, his voice died down, and Reggie stooped over him. Send my salary for September to my mother. Done great things with the bank, if I had been spared. Mistaken policy, no fault of mine. Then... He turned his face to the wall and died. Reggie drew the sheet over his face and went out into the veranda with his last mental stimulant, a letter of condolence and sympathy from the directors, unused in his pocket. If I'd only been ten minutes earlier, thought Reggie, I might have hardened him up 
to pull through another day. What an interesting story. We've all worked with someone like that before, haven't we? Someone who thinks they know everything and want to tell you about how much they know. If you want to match wits with these people, if you want to match wits with these people, you got to get educated yourself. Go to udemy.com and get educated on all sorts of topics from hobbies and arts and crafts to business and finance. Enter BBJ in the promo code and it will do absolutely nothing. But this is not a sponsored read. I would like to remind you that we are always on the hunt for great public domain stories that we can read on the podcast. And if you know of one, let me know. BigVoiceJ at gmail.com Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. It helps to spread the word that we're putting people to sleep every single night. New episodes release Monday to Friday, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern. At bedtime with bvj.com, the perfect place for you to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>